Well, this morning I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker this morning. He's uh, Dr. Gary Hollingsworth. Dr. Hollingsworth is the executive director of the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And uh, prior to serving there, he was pastor throughout churches throughout the Southeast. Uh, but he's been our executive director here in South Carolina for the past six years and has done a tremendous job serving the state of South Carolina and our churches. And we are pleased to have him with us this morning. I think the only thing I can say negative about Dr. Hollingsworth is I learned he's an Alabama fan. Uh, yeah. and, so, <laughs> and so, uh, but Dr. Hollingsworth, we are so thankful you're here with us this morning. And uh, would you join me in welcoming him to Brushy Creek Baptist Church? Oh. Thank you, Benji. Thank you so much, my brother. As a matter of fact, when I walked into Pastor Corey's, can I just lay this down and get it out of my way? Would that be okay with you guys if they're okay? I think since this one is working, um, he took me to Pastor Corey's office for just a few moments um, to have a last moment or two of prayer and reflection. And there in your pastor's office is this big Auburn thing. I had trouble praying. I just want y'all to know. But... Uh, it is a delight to be back here at Brushy Creek. It has been some time uh, since I've been able to be with you. I kind of felt like uh, stepping in this morning, though, that it was a, a sort of return to old home week, and I didn't even know it. First of all, Dr. Ralph Carter, are you here in the sanctuary somewhere? Where are you back there? Brother Ralph, thank my brother, I love you. South Carolina Baptists love you, and we are grateful for all that you continue to do. Uh, in the kingdom. I know y'all love Brother Ralph as I do. Just say thank you to Pastor Ralph. Appreciate you. I, I wish I had been here. Uh, you were on your way out as I was on my way in, so we, we missed each other uh, in, in, so, in terms of some of those good, good years and, of service, but it's so good. And then I do want to say thank you to your pastor uh, for the kind and gracious invitation uh, to be here with you today. But I also I uh, want to thank you, Brushy Creek, for several reasons, not the least of which that you are one of our strongest uh, participating, praying, giving, going churches in the South Carolina Baptist Convention. You are a pace setter in so many, many ways, and not just with your giving through the cooperative program, for which we are eternally grateful. You're always in one of our top tier of churches in your giving so that we might keep those 3,500 missionaries uh, on the field who are there this morning through the cooperative program and all of the ministries also that take place right here in our state is made possible because of, of churches like you. But also, you don't just give financially, but uh, you share many of your wonderful lay people. Teresa Garrick, who I got to reconnect with, Teresa served on our board and was chair of our budget, finance, and audit committee. And uh, I just love Teresa, and we had so many great years together, and it's so good to see her. And then our brother Homer Reeves, uh, who is on our board now. I know he spends his time between here and New York City, where he and his wife Jeanette live. But, and, and I just want to say thank you again uh, for so many, many ways. But there was one surprise that I had this morning. Brother Pat Roper, where are you, brother? Pat, where, where are you sitting right down here? I would not seen Pat Roper in a long, long time, but I was the associate pastor of a church in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, when Pat came to do a revival for us, and, and he walked right up this morning. It was just really great to reconnect. So I just want you all to know I'm feeling right at home this morning uh, here at, at Brushy Creek. If you have your Bible, I trust you do, but would you open with me to the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, Acts chapter 4. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you if you'll be kind enough uh, and reverent enough, if you will, uh, to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I don't know how Pastor Corey does it, but this is just a pattern that I've had for many years as we set the stage this morning to really talk about this very difficult message that the Lord has laid upon my heart. Um, and so thank you for allowing me the freedom to preach exactly what God has put on my heart. Pastor Corey told me to just preach what God told me to preach, and this is it. And uh, the topic is that no one ever said it was going to be easy. And by that, we're talking about being a follower of Christ today, particularly, is growing in its challenge. And uh, we're going to find those some encouragement and some hope from God's Word. And uh, I hope that this will be an encouragement to you. Would you stand with me now in honor of our God and allow me to read for us these first four verses of the fourth chapter 
of the book of Acts. And the word of God says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and listen to this, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. And may God enrich our lives and bless us this morning with this reading of his word. Thank you. And you may be seated. In the year 1563, a man by the name of John Fox wrote a book that was a compilation of stories, both biblically and historically, who had been persecuted, specifically given their lives as martyrs. We sang, as Brother Tom and our musicians led us, about those who have been martyred. The word martyr is the Greek term martyreo, which really means witness. In other words, we usually think of that word a martyr as someone who has given their life for Jesus Christ. Now, the interesting thing about Fox's book, of martyrs as it is called that even now in our day it is still in publication being in publication since 1563 and so while we normally think of persecution as far away we often think of persecution as something that is in the past the reality is that it's very much alive and it is happening today Kayla Mueller for example was a 26 year old devout Christian humanitarian worker who went into a very dangerous part of our world she left on August the 3rd of 2015 just six years or so uh, 2013 rather I should say uh, about nine years ago and while she was there she was kidnapped while in Syria and after 16 months of um, imprisonment and unimaginable torture for this young 26 year old girl she was killed by her captors on February the 6th of 2015. And while Kayla's story is an extreme story because not all persecution leads to someone giving their life physically, I just want to remind you that we don't have to go back to 1563 to Fox's Book of Martyrs to find that persecution is very real. Uh, More current stories that perhaps you're familiar with, not necessarily giving of their physical lives like Kayla, but uh, stories of bakers and florists who've been sued because they refused to participate in weddings where they would have had to compromise their biblical convictions about marriage being between one man and one woman. Uh, A story of a University of California intern who lost her position because she shared Jesus with a coworker on her own time off campus, and yet that was considered to be out of bounds. So the Atlanta... uh, fire chief who was fired because he dared to lead Bible studies and then actually published a book on biblical manhood and was let go. And even closer uh, to our own home right here just a few weeks ago, Anderson University's Dr. Evans Whitaker, our president there, he and I have been in constant contact about this, but they're under fire right now because they did not renew a contract for an adjunct drama teacher who publicly broke very clear rules of conduct, which she signed when she was hired but now it's being called discrimination in other words we don't have to give our physical life to really today experience many of these things that we would call suffering or persecution as a matter of fact one national publication recently reported that every month on average that 255 Christians worldwide are killed for their faith another 104 are abducted 180 Christian women every month are abused because they are Christian. Uh, Worldwide, on average, 66 churches are attacked because they stand for the gospel. And 160 Christians every month are detained without trial or imprisonment somewhere around the world. And so, indeed, this is a very current topic that demands our attention. And fortunately... We have plenty of biblical evidence, and we're going to look into that biblical evidence today. And at the end of this message, at least this seemed a little heavy for us this morning, 
I want to share with you some biblical hope and the purpose, if you will, and, and how God actually uses times of suffering and trial and persecution in his work in the world. So let's begin, first of all, because let's just think for a moment. These illustrations have helped us, but let's talk for a moment specifically from the Bible about the reality of persecution. You know, often our response to growing hostility towards Christians today, it can, it can make us well up with anger or defensiveness. But the truth of the matter is, is that if we take the Scripture seriously, which I know here at Brushy Creek you do, and if we really do believe the truth of the Word of God and the truth of the words of Jesus Himself, then opposition to our faith is actually to be expected. Uh, take, for example, Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Jesus himself speaking in that wonderful passage we call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus himself said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of of evil against you even falsely on my account the apostle peter says it this way in first peter chapter 4 verses 12 through 16 beloved do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange has happened to you but rejoice in so far as you share christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when glory his glory is revealed he goes on even to say that if you're insulted for the name of Christ you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you but now let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer and notice this word he throws in or even as a meddler no 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 he said yet if anyone suffers as a Christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in that name the Apostle Paul speaking to young Timothy as a mentor to this young pastor in the faith simply says it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 Paul says indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted and so we know that we find ample biblical evidence from Jesus from the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, and we could share others today, but there is a reality about persecution that really is to be expected. As a matter of fact, it, it almost goes this way, particularly the Apostle Peter, we should almost be surprised if we're not facing opposition for being Christians in this world. I had a staff member of the church I served over in Trustful, Alabama, years ago and she used to say it this way she would say every time we would gather for staff meeting i'd almost hear her name was ginger would say that say it this way she said well i know i'm walking the right direction because i met the devil head on this morning i like that if we're walking the right way we're going to face the devil almost at every turn if we're not facing the devil we may be walking with him not against him someone once said it this way and i believe that this is certainly true Sadly, it is true here in our wonderful United States of America, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but more free than any country on this planet. And that's why people are clamoring to get in at our borders. Why? Because we are a free country. We pray that we will continue to be, but someone once said this, and this is true. We, Americans, have been lazy with our liberty. We've enjoyed it. For so many years that now suddenly when some of those things that we have taken for granted are beginning to sort of be chiseled away at at the foundation we're not really quite sure how to react and so we know that there are biblical realities of the fact that persecution is real I didn't even take time to mention Joseph or Daniel or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or John the Baptist or the martyr Stephen or Paul and Silas and other historical records go read Hebrews chapter 11 verses 35 through 38 I chose not to put that in just because it's a little lengthy but read some of those passages just to be reminded again 
about the reality of persecution and suffering as Christians in this world. But secondly now, this think for a moment about the forms of persecution, the various forms in which we might experience persecution. Now, Kayla Muller and uh, others, Mueller rather, and others like her who have given their life, like the stoning of, of Stephen in the Bible, yes, they have lost their lives. Now, I pray and, and that that will not become the norm here in America. I'm not saying that one day in the future that could not become the case, but very few of us here at Brushy Creek Baptist Church, because of our liberties, because of our religious freedom, very likely are not going to give our lives unless we willingly put ourselves in harm's way, as some are doing today, and our 3,500 Southern Baptist missionaries who are there because of your giving, by the way, many of them, we just commissioned 53 new Southern Baptist missionaries at the Southern Baptist Convention out in Anaheim. No matter what else you read about what went on in Anaheim, some great things happened out there. And one of the greatest things was commissioning those 53 families, 53 missionary units. Many of them had to be, most of them as a matter of fact, were introduced behind a screen behind because we could not see their face. Many of them, their voices had to be altered as they were sharing their testimony. Why? Because we know that there are they're going to be going into dangerous places and parts of the world where it is illegal to be a Christian, much less to share your faith so that others may become Christians. But not many of us will ever experience that kind of persecution. But there are some other forms we want to talk about those for just a moment. For example, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, we just read it in verse 11, spoke of this kind of persecution, verbal. Sometimes persecution is just verbal. In that verse 11 of the fifth chapter, Jesus uses the word, he says, people will revile you. Now that's a word we probably don't use a lot in our common language every day, but that word revile means abusive hostile aggressive talk you with me aggressive hostile abusive speech against you now i grew up in alabama so let me just kind of put in my alabama vernacular have any of y'all ever been cussed out you know what i'm talking about all right i played football <laughs> i know what it's like to be cussed out i had a great football coach in high school he was a very vile man had a very vile temper and a vile language but I know what it's like to have somebody get into my face and speak words that you wouldn't be talking about on Sunday morning necessarily if you're with me that that's what this word literally means to be reviled means that we should expect that there will be verbal attacks against us for the sole purpose of the fact that we say that we are Christ followers and often that verbal persecution, Jesus says, is that it will come and people will speak against you falsely. In other words, they're not speaking the truth. They're actually speaking lies. And folks, there is a lot of that going on today. And I'm just going to say it this way. The introduction of social media, you know, my, my phone is called a smartphone. I don't know how smart it is. I argue with my phone a lot. Do you argue with your phone, you know, especially when you have the GPS on, I'm telling you, you know, and I don't know how smart our phones really are. But with this thing and this, this uh, invention of social media, which sometimes I say is anti-social media, is that suddenly even Christians, sadly, even in our Southern Baptist family, is that we suddenly believe that we can put anything on social media that we want to, and if you're a Christ follower, we can even degrade and downplay and even speak falsehoods and somehow feel that like we're going to get by with it because it was just on social media. Well, that, that's not a, social media is not an excuse, particularly for Christ followers, to step outside the bounds of what is proper speech. Don't be surprised when you are verbally assaulted. There's a second form of persecution, and I've mentioned this. Now, martyrdom would be in this category, but that is the physical. There is a physical aspect of this. It may not necessarily lead to death, but in the back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11, Jesus uses that word 
that we hear persecute. The word persecute, as used by Jesus, literally means to drive out with force, to chase something out. It was the word that was used to drive someone out or drive an animal out, if you will, by a whip. Now, again, most of us will never experience this kind, but it does happen. Again, let me go back to the Apostle Paul and give just one example of, 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 of his own testimony. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we find these verses beginning in verse 24. Paul says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst and often without food and cold and exposure. And I love this verse. And Brother Ralph, you can certainly appreciate this, having served your life as a pastor. And Paul says, and as if all of that were not enough, verse 28, and apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches. What he just said is pastoring is about like taking a beating. Is that true? Sometimes I'm telling you. may not be much worse. There are some times that we may experience some physical persecutions. There's a third type, though, that would be a little bit more relevant to us, and I call this the relational, the relational persecution. What, what do I mean by that? Well, do you know that you may lose some friends, even lose some family members when you get saved? Uh, we have right now on our staff at the South Carolina Baptist Convention, a young man who grew up in a very godless home. He came to Christ when he was in college. And when he came to know Jesus, his family completely abandoned him and has abandoned him still. He's completely ostracized by his family. They, they accuse him and think that he has joined a cult, a Baptist cult, I guess you might call it. And so he has experienced a form, a very real form of relational persecution. Most Muslim background believers, in other words, those who have come out of the Muslim faith and have come into the Christian faith, almost always face being ostracized by their family, their friends, and the community around them. I, I know that me personally, as, as a teenager, when I was uh, growing up, that I, the Lord really began to speak to me. I didn't know it was going to end up being ministry, but at about age 16, I'd been, I got saved when I was a little, little boy. But I didn't grow very much, but then suddenly I began to grow and read the Bible and, and, and take Christ seriously. And I lost some friends because I took a stance and said, I'm going this way, and they went that way. And it, it, it was a, a form of relational, if you will, separation that can happen. And there's one other form of persecution these days that I really believe will be one that will grow in the coming days, and that's financial the financial impact. Now, we, again, don't think much about that often, but uh, think once again about people who are perhaps because of their convictions, they're either going to lose their jobs or they're going to lose the opportunities of promotions. I, I mentioned the cake baker and the florist just earlier, and it may be that if someone knows that you are a Christ follower is that you're not going to get that advancement in your career, there will be a financial impact. I, when I pastored that same church in Trustville, Alabama, one of our members, a deacon in, in our church there, um, actually was working for a retail outlet, a, a chain of stores, and he was the store manager in this particular store, had decided that they were going to begin to sell alcohol, and, and uh, they came to him as the store manager and asked him to put his name on the application for the liquor license in order to approve that store to be able to sell alcohol. And out of his own conviction, he said, look, I, I'll continue to manage the store. It's your business, and they sell alcohol, but I'm not putting my name on the application. And they fired him. This has been some years ago, and I thank the Lord he got another job. But I'll never forget that when he came to me and he said, well, Pastor, I lost my job because I stood upon a conviction. Now, I don't want this message to create undue anxiety or fear, but let's just be reminded of ourselves that this is the world in which we're living. So could I quote the Apostle Peter one more time? 
don't think that this is some strange thing when all these things start happening. But folks, if you're going to continue to take this book seriously and your commitment to Christ seriously, expect the reality of many of these kinds of forms of persecution. But as I said in these closing moments, let's do in on something a little more upbeat and positive. So why in the world would Jesus say that we are even to rejoice when this comes our way? Well, that's because there is purpose in persecution. Always has been and always will be. So I want to suggest three very quick purposes, biblically, that we can find for what happens when we begin to experience these kinds of things. The first purpose we find biblically is that persecution will help us to grow in Christ likeness to grow in Christ likeness if you've ever prayed Lord let me be more like Jesus well I maybe the way that prayer gets answered is that you get persecuted we will never be more like Jesus perhaps than we are when we're experiencing these kinds of persecutions Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29 it has been granted to you watch this for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. In other words, if you really want to walk more closely with Jesus and look more like Jesus, it may very well be that when we begin to experience some of these things, that it will help us to grow in Christ likeness. Back in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, I've already read that passage, but let me go back and read one verse in particular, the 14th. When Peter says, now, if you're abused, here's the key, for the name of Christ, then blessed are you for the spirit of glory and God's rest is upon you. Now, listen, none of us want to voluntarily sign up for persecution just so we could be more like Jesus. We might even begin to take on a little bit of a, we hear this phrase, a martyr complex. Well, I'm just going to take it for the team. No, no, I don't think that we would volunteer but the reality is that when it does come, Christ, Jesus is working something in our life through that that we might not be able to get any other way. I love to read the story, as hard as it is, but about the stoning of Stephen. And again, the first biblical example, clearly in New Testament, martyr, martyred because of his faith in Christ. And in that 55th verse of the 7th chapter of the book of Acts, it says this, and he was taking his last breath on earth with the Apostle Paul, not yet a believer, standing by, approving, and witnessing all this. And don't tell me that it didn't have a great impact on Paul later on. But here's what it says. But he, Stephen, being filled with the Holy Spirit, gazed up into heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What an incredible incredible picture of someone who paid that price with his life he was more like Christ in his last breath than he had been in all of his other breaths so there's growth in Christ's likeness secondly persecution also will bring growth in our Christian character now there's a little subtle difference between just what I'm calling Christ likeness and Christian character for example in Romans chapter 5 verses 3 and 4 uh, kind of explains what I like to call the links in a chain, if you will, of the development of our Christian character. And here's the way Paul explained it to the Romans. He said, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Here's, here are the links. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. You see how that works, is that suffering and persecution is a part of that formula, of that recipe, of those links in the chain, which means that we're going to be developing our Christian character. Now, again, we may not like it, we may not want to do it, but I, I think of, uh, of a way to illustrate that would be like a, a weightlifter. A weightlifter, or even if you just work out to stay healthy, um, Back in my old days of playing some sports, I, I, I used to get in the weight room, and I, I never did like it. I liked the results when it was over, but I never did like it because 
what happens is that in weightlifting or working out of any sort, you're going to sort of face the reality of having to put your body through things that you don't want to do in order to become something that you want to become. I love what Vince Lombardi, that great NFL football coach, once said. He said, my job is to make grown men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve the dream they've had all of their life. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's the same thing with persecution, with suffering, with trial, with tribulation. Our character is being built so that we can be the person that God has made us to be. And then lastly, finally, persecution will lead to powerful gospel witness. Did you go back to Acts chapter 4, that fourth verse that we read to begin this message? 5,000 people, men, just the men, didn't count the women and others who might have come to faith in Christ just in that one instance alone is that there was an evangelistic success that was going on uh, now uh, another example of this is also found in the book of Acts the 16th chapter and I think uh, I'm going to read this very quickly I know it's a lot of passages but in Acts chapter 16 Paul and Silas you remember were arrested uh, in, in uh, put in the jail in Philippi, the city of Philippi, because they had gone in, and uh, there was this slave girl who was a fortune teller, and she had these men who were using her to make a lot of money off of her fortune-telling gift, and uh, she becomes a Christ follower, and suddenly their cash cow girl has dried up, and they're very angry about it, and they end up arresting Paul and Silas, and they have them thrown in jail. That's the backdrop, and so listen to now Acts chapter 16, the rest of that story. And the jailer then, father in this jail, called for lights and rushed in with trembling and fear and fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought him out and said, this Philippian jailer now, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took them that very hour of the night, washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once. And he and all of his family and then he brought them up to his house, set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Do you see the picture? There was a great explosion of evangelism when persecution happened. It always happened in the book of Acts that way. Now let me just encourage us here as we close. I want to just encourage you with this. I believe America is ripe for revival. I, I believe we are conditions are existing right now that have pretty much always existed not only in our country but worldwide and other great revival movements of the past the conditions that our culture and our society and our country are experiencing are the very things that often are a preview and a prelude to a great sweeping spiritual awakening so brothers and sisters of Brushy Creek let's pray to that end that God will bring great evangelistic witness even as we perhaps suffer more for our faith than we ever have before. John Chrysostom was one of the early church fathers. He lived from 347 to 407 A.D., the 4th century A.D. He was arrested for preaching the gospel, preaching against the tenet of the state church, and he was even brought before the emperor of his day. And uh, when he stood before the emperor, the emperor looked at him and threatened him and said this. He said, I will banish you, Chris, John Chris Hossum, from the country to which Chris Hossum looked at the emperor. And he said, sir, you cannot banish me because the whole world belongs to my father. So you can't banish me. So then the emperor said, well, then I'll take away all of your property and Chrysostom said, well, sir, no, you cannot do that because my treasure is in heaven. And then he said, well, well then I'm going to take you to a place and leave you there where there's not a friend that you can speak to. And John Chrysostom replied, with all due respect, sir, you cannot because I have a friend who is closer than a brother. I have Jesus as my friend. Finally, the emperor threatened and said, well, then I'm going to take away your life. I'll kill you. And Chrysostom said, you cannot because my life is hid with God in Christ. And you know what the emperor said in reply? I love this. He said, what can I do to a man like this? 
Folks, I want you to know that's exactly what the world will say. What can, what can the world do to a man, a woman, a teenager, a boy, a girl who is so staunchly standing upon our convictions that nothing of this world can allure us anymore because, as the old gospel song said, Brother Tom, my home is in heaven. I'm just passing through this world right now. Would you bow your head as we pray? Father, may very well be this morning there's someone in this room who do, does not... Hey, I'm Pastor Corey, and I just want to say thank you for worshiping with us online. It is so great that through technology you were able to join us today. I hope while you got to sing with God's people and hear His Word preached, you were moved and touched by the Holy Spirit. Maybe while you were worshiping with us online, the Lord began to prompt your heart. Maybe He's calling you to make some sort of decision or follow Him in a more tangible way. Or maybe you just realized you need some help and you want some other people to come along beside you and encourage you in your walk with the Lord. If that's the case, we want to help you. We want to connect with you. We want to tell you that we're a church that's here for you. There are two ways that you can contact us. First, you can click on the link in this post above the video, and you'll find all kinds of ways to hear more about who we are, fill out a contact information, or put in a prayer request. Or if you'd like to, you can email the email that's coming across the screen now, prayer at brushycreek.org. If you send an email to that address, it will get to our staff, and we'll be glad to return it, to pray for you, and to care about you. It is so neat to be able to worship together from all over the world. We would love for you to come join us in person sometime, but until then, we hope to meet you here again next week.